Well, we've talked about several things. We've talked about the five aggregates, the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness that make you up. We have talked about the three kinds of feelings which you uh, experience. And uh, we have talked a little bit about how you get involved with these feelings. And when you do not understand how their uh, origination works and how their disappearance works and their gratification, the danger and the escape of these feelings, then uh, you are unable to ease the suffering because you become involved with them and you will lose the present moment and you will uh, be stuck with past memories that turn into emotions or future uh, uh, thoughts that are worries about things that might happen and this causes a lot of stress, a lot of strain. We talked about how the Buddha, uh, is, uh, his whole plan was to shift us from unwholesome uh, thoughts and speech and actions, unwholesome uh, mind states, uh, because everything starts in the mind first, uh, over to wholesome states, wholesome mind states. And then we talked about how the, bu the Buddha had a little bit of a solution. Let's look at just one slide here that we have up that shows us practice that we talked about. And this practice was called, Right Effort had the four steps of recognizing these unwholesome mind states, releasing the unwholesome mind states, and then relaxing anywhere you are, anytime and then bringing up a wholesome mind state by smiling and returning to what you are doing in the present moment. If you are meditating, it means to come back to your object of meditation and to continue doing that while you are smiling and to keep these wholesome states going. And what the uh, Buddha showed us was this cycle, if we keep moving on this cycle, it will eventually free us from the suffering. Well, the other thing I told you last time was I was going to show you where, uh, what happens with the energy, um, the energy, why it gets uh, so moving so fast and we, we uh, these cycles of uh, what's happening from the time you're six sense doors have contact and you experience seeing and hearing and tasting and touching or uh, uh, the body, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting or touching with the body. What happens is, or even with the mind, mind objects, thoughts coming up, and what happens is it's like a runaway train. You get so involved in things. It feels like everything is happening to you on top of your head instead of from you. How does that happen? I was going to show you how to understand the energy in the cycle of the arising emotions on this chart right here. It's like you have a car. It works the same way with your car. And you put the key into the ignition of your car and you turn the key and contact happens and the engine starts that's feeling when the feeling comes up in first gear of your car the car jerks forward slightly and that's when I don't like it or I like it happens and then second gear speeds up a little more and you get involved with your driving and that's clinging and that's the clinging is the story about why you don't like it. All of the concepts, the ideas, uh, the reasons, the, all of these, e even imagination that about why you don't like something, why I don't like it. And then third gear begins to uh, involve the real driving as uh, you're going down a, a ramp to get onto a highway. And this is your habitual tendency. You always drive the same way when you get onto a highway. And sometimes in life, most of the time, when something happens and we react, we choose the same reaction over and over and over again. 
And this is a problem. It's a problem for the world because the world is suffering from a great deal of war and strife right now. And that's happening because of habit, habitual tendencies. This is what keeps us uh, this cycle being born again and again and again. And then the fourth gear of the car is faster still on the highway, and this is the birth of action speeding down onto the highway and taking off. And then what happens? What happens then is your car runs out of gas. <laughs> and the aging, the sorrow, the lamentation, the pain, the grief, and the despair of being caught alone on the side of the road and then finally when someone comes and gives you some gas for your car that's the death of this event well that's that's quite a chart <laughs> but today um, what I wanted to show you was that's how the suffering actually happens and gets moving and moving and churning and churning and then you can't stop it one of the things I uh, wanted to tell you was some people wondered where did this uh, thing about the smile come from. The smile actually in Buddhism, I think it goes back to the very first meditation that the Buddha advised us to teach before we got into even right effort. Well, what was that? He told us that we should start by the three pillars. We should start with the three pillars of Buddhism, which uh, are called the dana, the sila, and the bhavana. So I want to talk to you today about the dana, the sila, and the bhavana, because these are the preparatory steps for you preparing your mind preparing your mind and your body and your heart to prepare it to succeed in the practice of right effort. And many times we have had situations where people have contacted me and they've been in very bad situations in life and they have uh, been nearly suicidal or they have been extremely depressed or uh, anxious about something in life and because of the extreme concern that they have about what's happening to them and it feels like it's a weight right upon them one of the first things that I tell them to do is you know what you need to smile and they'll say what <laughs> and I'll say you need to smile first. And the reason that you need to smile is because you need to lighten up. Because the meditation, no matter what it is that you are practicing, it will not work unless you begin to lighten up. And so what we do with the person is a lot of times we will tell them, to simply start smiling and relax into life more. Take your shoes off. Go for a walk in the sand. Remember what that's like. Remember what it's like to stop and smell the roses. Remember what it's like to just sit down, be quiet, and even just play. Just going to a beach and just making wet sandcastle, drip castles or something. You know, just doing these childlike things is not being childish. It is opening your heart to what is here in life. Try to stop and try to find this. One of the easiest ways in a busy, busy society to just remember what it felt like to be open like that is to start smiling. And your smiling is preparing you for a successful meditation. So this week, what I want you to think about is I want you to think about just smiling this week. I'll tell you a story. When I uh, sometimes in the, uh, in the forest, uh, when things get hard and there's a storm and there seems like there's a lot of things to clean up and a lot of things to do. Uh, you know, I'm in my 60s and I think, what are you doing here? 
<laughs> and then I, I just get like I'm ready to go say to Bonte, you know, I don't know about this. And then the phone will ring. And an adventure will start that sets me up to want to keep going for another year or more. <laughs> and the one story I remember was Vladimir from Vladivostok in Russia. And Vladimir called on the phone. He called. And uh, on the phone, he wanted me to teach him meditation on the phone. But then as we talked a little bit more, it became obvious that he was very, very depressed. And as I listened, he had been through a work accident where he was damaged and could not go to work anymore. So he was living in a situation, if you can imagine, of not being able to sit more than a half an hour, not being able to walk more than half an hour, and you had to stop and change position. But the worst one was trying to go to sleep at night with someone taking care of him by the bed and staying in the room and turning him every half hour so that he would not become paralyzed. I couldn't even fathom this man's life. It was so difficult for him. And that's when I realized he was ready to just hang it up and to leave. He was ready to check out because he was so depressed and at the heart of the matter there was no smile. He thought he had nothing to give anyone anymore, nothing of value from him. He had his relatives, many of them had simply gone away and he was alone. But he sounded in his voice like he really wanted something unique. He needed something to give other people. So what I told him on the advice of my teacher was, I want you to go and I want you to smile for one week. And if you do this, you will have a different perspective of your world. And he thought about it. I didn't know if he would call me back. I said, I want you to do this and I want you to call me back in a week or two. Well, I waited and he um, he didn't really call back until almost the two-week mark, and then the phone rang. And when he talked to me, he told me this. He said, oh, this is wonderful, he said. This is great stuff, great stuff. I can, I can give this to other people. He was so happy. And I said, what happened to you? He said, well, I had to go and see a friend. I started smiling to everyone. And when I walked down the street, the homeless man, I smiled at him and he smiled back. And then I went further. I went down and some policeman was not happy, but he looked at me and I smiled and he smiled back. And I went to the train station, I went to the ticket people, and they were very unhappy. Everybody was being mean to them, and I smiled at her, and I got the ticket for half price. <laughs> and he said, you know, I can really give this to people. This is really something. And it changed everything, because the man had something simple to give. And he started to tell other people about this. And they started to come and visit him. And he was sharing more and more. And this really opened his world. I'm telling you, then the secret to the smile is not smiling. The secret to the smile is giving it away. That's what you've got to do. That's what's the most important part. So when you are practicing, I want you to remember how much value this was for Vladimir. I want you to remember it's a simple thing. You know, somebody told me once from New York State, they called me and they said, 
What is this you're telling people you can't affect the world around you? Don't you know you have to change inside? You have no effect on people around you. I said, this is not true. I said, I've been a mother. I have had children. And I will tell you that you can help to change everything if you just relax and smile at certain times. He said, what are you telling me? I know I can't affect anyone around me. I said, what you have to do is go to a supermarket on a Saturday. He said, a supermarket on a Saturday? I said, yes, you have to go to a supermarket on a Saturday. You have to get a basket and you have to wait until the people are in line and there is a mother with a baby child who is crying and a new cashier. Then what do I do, he said. <laughs> I said, you get behind her and when the baby is crying, you start to smile to the baby and occupy the baby's time and because this baby was crying all 40 people around you are just sweating and they're uptight and they're really everybody is nervous because this poor mother is upset over her child and the cashier doesn't know what to do because she's a new cashier and you come along and you start to talk to the baby and compliment the mother on the child. And the mother gets happy and the baby is quiet and the cashier is relieved and you have changed everybody in the room. Well, he did that. He went away and he wrote me and he said, I did it. I affected the world around me. I said, of course you did. It has to start inside here, but then when you start doing loving kindness and you start doing the uh, karuna, the, the loving kindness is the metta, when you start living that and giving it away, then you become a light. You become the wick of the candle. You become the light that is opening up the darkness for people around you. And it's all starting with a smile. And this is just what the Buddha was talking about when he was teaching the metta, the loving kindness to people. It's not something we just say to ourselves and we use a mantra to say it and say it and we go home and feel very well that we did that today. That's not the answer. That doesn't change anything, but perhaps you feel a little better about yourself. It's when you begin to open your heart used with this dana, and this metta, this smiling, is a primary part of this generosity. You see, dana was generosity, and in order to prepare the way for your meditation to succeed, you have to have this ingredient of this dana operating. Dana is three forms of dana. It is a mental generosity, kind thoughts for other people. It's kind speech for other people. And then it is kind actions for other people. So you can activate this anywhere in a train station, helping someone cross the street, stopping if someone's car is broke down and helping them change a tire, giving somebody a little bit of money so they can have some food, helping somebody carry bags to the car. It's endless. It doesn't have to be that you turn into the United Nations and cause world peace all of a sudden. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. But if everybody started behaving this way, and this is one of the reasons, oh, I love Sri Lanka. Because the people are so kind and their generosity is near the surface, they w are helpful to you. They will try to speak with you, try to help you get where you need to go. And they're so kind and so generous 
it is just a wonderful thing to behold. The second kind uh, point we said was the three of these three pillars was we said generosity first that was the dawn and the next we said sila and sila are the five precepts and if you don't know the five precepts the five precepts are a guiding form of morality but it's not just a guiding form of morality it's something that will make everything work very well and I tend to go back to the car analogy to show you that uh, these precepts work the same way as a supercar that you have and you really love and you want it to work really well. You have basically in your five precepts, you have first of all, no killing or harming of living beings. This is the first precept, okay? Then the second precept is no stealing no, not taking what is not freely given. This is the way you look at that. You don't want anyone to do that to you. You don't do that to anyone else. The third one is no wrong sexual ac activity. And this is important to understand. It means don't do anything with someone who is not willing to do it with you, has permission to do it with you, is not too young and living still with their parents, don't do it with someone else's mate and uh, don't do anything that's going to cause uh, um, cause painful feelings to arise that are mental or physical in you the other person or people around you don't do this because you don't want anyone to ever do this to you either do not lie but it's not just do not lie do not lie do not get involved with gossip and do not slander. Gossip is talking about things when somebody is not around and talking about the person, you don't know if it's true or not. Slander is when you talk about something for the purpose of dividing people up. Do not do this because this is very bad karma coming back around to you. And if you don't believe in karma, just listen for a minute, because I, I don't like to talk to people about morality, but it's important you understand the, the purpose of the precepts is not just a lecture on morality. It's a, a purpose is the functionality of life. If you want things to run smoothly, then you follow these precepts. And the last one, the fifth one, was that you don't have recreational drugs or alcohol because that will loosen the mind, you know, fog up the mind and you'll break the other four precepts so you get in trouble that way. So showing you the analogy of the car really quickly, just imagine you have uh, a, uh, um, a Ferrari <laughs> and it's your car and it's fantastic and the uh, factory gave you a factory book that told you what this car could do. And the car has five fluids, okay? The car has gas, it has oil, it has brake fluid, it has transmission fluid, and it has steering fluid in it. Now, if one of these fluids is not in that car, will the car do what the factory told you it was going to do? Nope, it won't do it. If you don't have the gas or you don't have the oil or if you don't have the transmission fluid, the car will not run the way the factory said it should run. So if you want the car to run properly, you have to have all five of these fluids in the car or it won't operate. It's simple. This is what the Buddha was trying to tell us with the precepts. If you want your life to run easily, then you need to have things aligned properly and keep these precepts so that you don't have any bad karma coming around to bother you in your life. You don't want what I call karmic kickback. If I do something bad to someone, it will come back eventually and it will kick back. You don't want that to happen. So you see the precepts basically when you talk about them in this light, these were a modus operandum for your life, just the way I'm talking about a Ferrari and the factory car, uh, the factory car version that's in the book 
coming to life for you as long as you have all the fluids in the car. You want to have all the precepts in your life. The last part of the three pillars was, uh, is actually the bhavana. And we've talked about bhavana, which means mind development. And the mind development is the practice of right effort and the practice of using loving kindness and using compassion in your life. That's what you want to do. You want to learn to use the loving kindness and use the compassion in your life systematically, making it happen. And there was a woman who um, was working and she was going to lose her job and we taught her how to smile and how to use loving kindness and how to be compassionate and uh, balanced when she did her job and when she learned how to do that, her job, which was very difficult, turned not so difficult and turned around to be a compassionate thing that she could help people to understand instead of bad news that she was carrying to them. And when her boss found out how happy she got, he, she got excited and she went home with the same training that we gave this person and gave it to her little girl who was having trouble in school. And then the mommy and the little girl were practicing loving kindness and karuna together. And then this woman came back to the office, decided to have a department head meeting and share it with the other people. I, I like to call this story a very special story because it, to me, it showed me at a particular time when I needed to know what we were teaching was very effective. It showed me personally that you can still drop a pebble in the pond of water and the ripples will flow out from it just like that. Just like that. It's like the reverberation flows out. The little ripples in the pond go out and touch the next person, the next person, the next person. This is how Buddhism spread. This is what this practice was about in the beginning. This practice was not isolated. It was not only found in the temples. It was not only found in the forest monk's possession under a tree. It was used by the lay people, and this is how they did it. They shared it. And it was a simple, easy to understand practice that in this case was immediately effective. And it was so interesting. She became a student. She learned more. She practiced more. And I hope to see her when I go home. So I'm going to let you go now. And next time we come back, we are going to look at a sutta that I think that you will all enjoy. It is the Samana Mandika Putta Sutta. And this is the story of some of the characters in the uh, Buddhist Nikayas that it will give you a feel for how the Buddha was shifting certain things from unwholesome to wholesome and why the practice that I showed you makes so much sense and I hope to see you next time. Sadhu, sadhu.